Hidden within the depths of China's past lies one of the greatest untold secrets of history. Many of the greatest inventions and discoveries in human history were made in China. These ancient Chinese inventions had such an incredible impact on the world that their influences are still felt to this day. China, the Middle Kingdom, the oldest continuous civilization on Earth. Since the days of Marco Polo, this exotic land has captured the imagination of the Western world. But the West has also looked down upon China as a backward country, centuries behind Europe in science and technology, a sleeping dragon that slumbered while Western ingenuity created our modern world. One hundred and sixty years ago, the British Navy underlined the West's sense of superiority. In the year 1842, a British invasion fleet of paddle-wheel steamships prepared for battle off the coast of China. They were surprised to discover that the Chinese fleet included several paddle boats of their own. The British opened fire. The Chinese warships were no match for the modern British cannon. The Chinese realized they couldn't compete against the superior military technology of the Western invaders, and with great shame, they surrendered. Commander W. H. Hall was first mate on one of the victorious British ships. He recorded his amazement at how fast the Chinese had copied the British idea of the paddle boat. The most remarkable improvement of the Chinese Navy was the construction of several large wheeled vessels. The idea must have been suggested to them by reports concerning the wonderful power of our wheeled vessels. Commander Hall could not have been more mistaken. In fact, far from copying the British, the Chinese had attempted to revive an ancient invention of their own. A thousand years earlier, the Chinese had whole fleets of paddle wheelers. By the 12th century, these paddle boat warships had reached lengths of over 90 meters, with crews of 800 men. The paddle boat warship was just one of many amazing ancient Chinese inventions. In 1974, three Chinese farmers made a stunning archaeological find, one that would prove that the technology of the ancient Chinese was by far the most advanced in the world. While digging a well, the farmers stumbled on broken pieces of a statue. They had discovered one of the legendary terracotta warriors of Qin Shi Huang Di, the first emperor of China. Excavation of a vault below revealed thousands of soldiers in battle formation. An entire army designed to follow its emperor into eternity. 250 years before Christ, this powerful force ruthlessly conquered all the rival kingdoms of China and unified them into an empire. Archaeologists believe that they have uncovered part of the answer as to what made this army so invincible. Originally, these terracotta soldiers were equipped with real weapons. Weapons that had mainly disintegrated when the farmers made their find. But archaeologists did find metal remnants of these weapons scattered around the figures. Out of the dust emerged sword blades that were still sharp after two millennia. 
They also uncovered intricate bronze crossbow triggers. These mechanisms were precision engineered using a technology 1300 years ahead of their time and were as complex as modern rifle bolts. 2000 years ago, no other people on Earth had anything near the technology to produce even one of these triggers, let alone the hundreds of thousands the Emperor had mass-produced for his army. With these crossbows, Chinese troops became the most feared in the world. In the centuries to come, the Chinese crossbow would become deadlier. The Chinese armies discovered how to attach a magazine of bolts to the crossbow, creating in effect the world's first machine gun. A force of a hundred men armed with these lethal weapons could fire 2,000 arrows in only 15 seconds. Thousands of years later, Chinese soldiers were still using crossbows against the British invaders. In the 19th century, it may have been an outdated weapon, but 2,000 years ago, the crossbow was one of the most high-tech inventions the world had ever seen. In ancient China, the army invented several high-tech secret weapons. Along with the crossbow, they developed the world's first metal stirrups. These were cast in China as early as the 4th century BC. Europeans didn't have the stirrup until the Middle Ages. Until then, European warriors had to grip the mane of the horse to stay on. The Chinese invention of the stirrup allowed Western knights in heavy armor to stay on horseback and thereby dominate the peasant classes. But despite these military innovations, ancient China's greatest technological advantages over the rest of the world wasn't to be found in the hands of soldiers, but in the hands of farmers. The ancient Chinese invention that probably had the greatest impact on world history was the iron plow. With this remarkable innovation, Chinese farmers could drive deep furrows through the heaviest soil. These early plows had wings to throw soil off the plow and reduce friction. And the list of ancient China's agricultural innovations only begins with the plow. They were the first to plant crops in rows, which gave each seed room to grow. Early Europeans, on the other hand, scattered the seed by hand. This was extremely wasteful, as most of the seed was eaten by birds. The Chinese, on the other hand, used seed drills to plant the seed in rows and deep in the soil safe from hungry flocks. Ancient Chinese farmers carried heavy loads with what they call the wooden ox, what we call the wheelbarrow, a device so simple that it seemed no one needed to invent it. But incredibly, wheelbarrows didn't exist in Europe before the 11th or 12th century. The oldest surviving picture of the wheelbarrow in China dates back a thousand years. The first European iron plows and seed drills were also largely copied from the Chinese. These inventions led directly to the European agricultural revolution. The agricultural revolution led to the industrial revolution.
In fact, part of the basis of the West modernization came from China. And so the rise of our modern world was not by any means a purely Western phenomenon, as everyone assumes. The agriculture that the Chinese were strong in depended very much on water control. And to master all the uh, technologies needed to make that water work for vast plots of land and, and thus enable productivity to continue to grow, all that over the centuries gave that, the, the Chinese Empire that edge over other people. One particularly ingenious Chinese invention for controlling irrigation is the chain pump, which dates back to the first century AD. Rotated by either wind or pedal power, this pump could haul enormous quantities of water from lower to high levels to irrigate more fields. These chain pumps were the world's first conveyor belts. The chain pump was exported to all parts of the world including Thailand, where wind power versions can still be found today. The Chinese also mastered how to use water for transport. All of China's major dynasties built great canals to supply their capitals with grain from distant areas. And the greatest of them all was the Grand Canal one of the most impressive and least known engineering feats in history. The aquatic equivalent of the Great Wall. Built to link the Fertile South with the Dry North, the Grand Canal is 2400 kilometers long. The equivalent of a canal linking Paris to Rome. During the 6th and 18th centuries, this canal was dug by millions of peasants, working the fields by day and digging the canal by night. At one point, they dug 1,700 kilometers in three years, incredibly all by hand. Over the centuries, China became crisscrossed with a web of waterways. And as a result, Chinese engineers invented an ingenious way to safely transfer boats to canals of different water levels. This is called the Canal Pound Lock, an invention traditionally credited to Leonardo da Vinci. But pound locks were being built in China hundreds of years before he was born. A pound lock has two gates. As a boat enters, the gate closes behind it. The water then either rises or falls to match the level of water in the direction the boat is sailing. When it reaches the correct level, the other gate opens and lets the boat through. Naturally, thousands of bridges were built to span this web of waterways. While the Romans needed multiple arches to bridge wide rivers, the Chinese met the challenge with a single arch. It would take centuries for such a radical design to be adopted in Europe. Poets describe these bridges as rainbows lying on the waves. This elegant shape had a practical purpose. Large barges could easily pass underneath, again boosting the river trade. A thousand years ago, crops poured in from the countryside on the canals. Chinese cities became the largest and most prosperous in the world. Certainly, it was China at its richest relative to the rest of the world. And it was the result of many centuries of agricultural management. The markets were open 24 hours a day. The streets filled with merchants, hawkers, entertainers, fortune tellers, authors, and huge crowds of visitors. It was said at the time that there were more riches to be found on a single street in China than in an entire European city. There were only a few men from the West 
who were lucky enough to visit China in its prime. They included the Venetian merchants, Marco Polo and his brothers. They witnessed countless marvels that wouldn't be seen in Europe for centuries. The world's first restaurants, for example, complete with tables and menus. These restaurants offered the common people a chance to eat out very cheaply for the first time in history. Here they could enjoy the world's first distilled alcohol, including sake, brandy and whiskey. Marco Polo was especially impressed with noodles, which it is said he introduced to the West. This is still under debate, as it is more likely the idea of spaghetti was brought to Europe from China by Arab traders a few centuries earlier. Some restaurants boasted specialities so tasty that the Imperial Palace ordered them for banquets. This was probably the world's first example of the takeaway. Walking along the street, Marco Polo may have seen the world's first folding umbrellas. In France and England, this umbrella did not appear until about the middle of the 17th century, when all things Chinese were the rage. The folding umbrella was probably one of the many things introduced from China to the West. There is also evidence that the Chinese were playing football about 2,000 years ago. The modern game of football originated in England in the year 1863 and then spread around the world. But records of the game in China go back two millennia. Chinese prints show nobles and commoners joining in a game of football with an inflated leather ball. Ancient writings tell us that the feet and body, not the hands, were used to propel the ball. Maybe the world's most popular sport was actually first played in China. Although the ancient Greeks may also have a claim to originating the sport. And believe it or not, the earliest version of golf seems to be a Chinese game first mentioned in 10th century texts. It was very popular among soldiers and sometimes even emperors would play. The game involved bamboo clubs and hardwood balls and holes in the ground marked with flags. An ancient Chinese mural depicts some golfers with their caddies. One is clearly lining up a putt. There is no doubt, however, that Scotland can claim to be the modern birthplace of golf, which they invented in the 14th century. Recent evidence has also come to light that yet another game treasured in the West seems to have developed from an ancient Chinese technique of divination. Chess arose in the 5th century AD in northwest India, according to most accounts. But some scholars suggest that chess seems to have developed from an ancient Chinese technique of fortune telling. Two players would attempt to read the balance of the opposite yin and yang forces in the universe. The pieces on the board in this divination technique represented the sun, moon, planets, stars, the constellations, and the river in the middle, the Milky Way. Historians speculate that this game was passed into India, where the clash of yin and yang was transformed into a battle of two human armies, like the chess we know today. For some people, Kites may be little more than children's toys, but in ancient China, they were put to serious uses. Some of the earliest kites were utilized by the military. During one battle, soldiers flew kites over the enemy's city walls and used the length of the string to determine the distance. They could then calculate how far to dig a tunnel to get under the city walls. These military kites were shaped like hawks, possibly to fool the enemy into thinking they were real birds. But this ruse 
did not always work. It is also recorded that the enemy sometimes succeeded in shooting down the kites. Historical records also state that kites were used to scatter subversive information over enemy forces. These were probably the first propaganda leaflet drops in history. During the early 1800s, Sir George Cayley, the British father of early aeronautics, studied kites to design the world's first glider. Sir George's chauffeur made a short flight in this glider, but after a rough landing, he handed in his resignation, complaining that he was employed to drive, not fly. Cayley's glider was used by the Wright brothers as a model to build their first aeroplane. Many still believe that Orville and Wilbur Wright became the first human beings to fly. But according to ancient Chinese official histories, it is written that in the year 550 AD, the then emperor's hobby was using condemned prisoners as test pilots for man-bearing kites. One prisoner managed to fly over three kilometers The strangest role for the man-bearing kite, however, was as a tool for fortune-telling. Marco Polo recorded the practice. Before a ship would make a voyage, the crew would make a big kite and find someone either stupid or drunk to tie to it. If they managed to fly the unfortunate soul high into the sky, the merchants all scrambled to board the ship. If they couldn't manage to set the man aloft, this was an ill omen, and the ship could stay in port all year. What goes up must come down. So naturally, the Chinese were interested in parachutes. The invention of the parachute is generally credited to Leonardo da Vinci. The Chinese, however, were actually jumping with parachutes 1,500 years before. In 1688, the French ambassador to Thailand witnessed Chinese acrobats use parachutes. After reading the ambassador's report, the European inventor of the parachute, Louis-Sebastien Lenormand of France, was inspired to start trials. The West still thinks Europeans were the first to set balloons aloft. But the pioneers of hot air ballooning were the Chinese. Tribes in southern China, near the Thai border, may well have been the first to send balloons up into the air. A Chinese children's toy also had a surprising influence on the history of aviation. As early as the 4th century AD, Chinese children were also playing with the helicopter top, called the bamboo dragonfly. Another version was launched with a bowstring mechanism. In 1842, Sir George Cayley designed the first practical helicopter based on this Chinese helicopter top. This ancient Chinese toy became the direct ancestor of the helicopter rotor and the aircraft propeller. The helicopter top in China led to nothing but amusement and pleasure. But 1400 years later, it was to be one of the key elements in the birth of modern aeronautics. Just another obscure Chinese contribution to what we consider today as technology credited purely to the West. Travelling through Chinese cities full of wonder, Marco Polo must have been amazed at the advantages enjoyed by the Chinese. But they had also suffered more than their fair share of problems. Floods, war and disease took their toll, and the Chinese people had always been devastated by violent tremors.
132 AD, one man confronted the problem of earthquakes. His name was Chang Hung, a scholar official at the imperial court. Highly educated, he was a brilliant mathematician and engineer. He was, they say, the first man to describe a round earth in infinite space and to devise longitude and latitude for navigators. The Chinese called this method throwing a net over the earth. Chang Hung knew that to aid and control sections of the empire that had been hit by an earthquake, the imperial court needed to know immediately when and where the disaster struck. So he devised a machine which could indicate the direction in which an earthquake was happening elsewhere in the empire, even though no movement could be felt in the capital. At the slightest tremor, an inverted pendulum knocked a bronze ball from the mouth of a dragon into the mouth of a bronze toad. By looking to see which ball had been released, the imperial court could determine which direction the epicenter of the earthquake lay. Court records of the time refer to an occasion when a ball fell, when no perceptible shock could be felt. Skeptics declared Chang Hung's invention a sham. But several days later, a messenger arrived in the capital with news of an earthquake 650 kilometers away in the direction the ball indicated. Here was the proof. Chang Hung had indeed succeeded in constructing the world's first earthquake detector. Modern seismographs only began development in the year 1848, almost 2,000 years later. Early Chinese scholars, like Chang Hung, were intrigued by forces invisible to the eye. They invented strange objects to detect and measure these mysterious forces. One example of these miraculous instruments is the bronze magic mirror, invented in China as early as the 5th century AD. When the polished surface of a magic mirror was held up to the bright sunshine, the design etched on the back of the mirror was reflected in shadow, as if the light rays were penetrating the solid bronze. It took Western scientists over a hundred years to unravel the secret. The surface of the polished mirror contains minute variations which the naked eye cannot detect. The incredibly precise construction of these mirrors is evidence of the advanced metalworking skills of the ancient Chinese. As are the strange objects known as spouting bowls, some of the most impressive artifacts of ancient Chinese science. These bronze bowls are so precisely proportioned that when the two handles are rubbed at the correct rate, water spouts can be as high as a meter. It has been said that this is the manner in which the emperor washed his face. These bronze bowls are triumphs of precision casting. Just like the seismograph, they were built to measure the mysterious force of vibrations. But Chang Hung and other scholars were especially fascinated with the most mysterious invisible force of all, magnetism. The result of their fascination was the creation of the world's first magnetic compass. This was called a sinon, a section of lodestone which is naturally magnetic was carved into the shape of the Big Dipper and placed on a polished board. The circular center of the board represented heaven and the square represented earth and the spoon the Big Dipper. This constellation was especially sacred as two stars in the Big Dipper always point to the pole star. The emperor was the earthly counterpart of the pole star around which all the other stars rotated. <laughs>
The master himself, Confucius said, He who governs virtuously may be compared to the polar star, which keeps its place as the other stars turn around it. All visitors to the emperor had to sit to his south so that the stars could rotate around his head. Therefore, officials around the emperor were seen as inhabiting the constellations rotating around the polar star. And so the Sinon was a mystical instrument used not for navigation, but as a tool for geomancy, or Feng Shui. Feng Shui is a technique for aligning cities and houses harmoniously with the Earth's forces. Forces detected with the aid of this compass. The Sinon evolved into more complex Feng Shui compasses, which are still in use today. Hundreds of years before the first compass was to be found on a European ship, small factories in China mass-produced a variety of compass designs. The world's first prototype of the dry modern navigational compass was called the magnetic turtle. South was indicated by the direction of the needle, which was attached to a magnet concealed inside the model. Around the year 850 AD, Chinese ships began to carry a water compass to help them navigate during murky weather and storms, when there was no way to use the sun or the stars. This simple mariner's compass would always point south, unlike modern compasses today. Many historians believe that European sailors got the compass from the Chinese. The compass was discovered in China around the year 1200. Our records show that compasses were fairly common in Europe around 1500. These initially were imported by the Venetians from China and in turn sold around the Mediterranean and Northern Europe. And so, whilst we have clear evidence of its usage in Europe around 1500, we have also clear evidence of its existence in China around the year 1200. On Western ships in around the year 1500, the use of the compass was steeped in magic and superstition. Because of the inexplicable power of the magnetized needle to find north smacked of black magic, pilots in Columbus's time kept their compasses hidden from the view of the crew, as anybody who used the magnetic compass might be accused of trafficking with Satan. These early sailors also believed that bad breath could demagnetize the compass needle, so onions and garlic were often left off the menu. To counteract these superstitions, pilots put the holy cross on the compass face to reassure the sailors. Compasses of a certain period have a scroll or ornamentation on the east point this practice was actually discontinued around 1850, but it was based on a much earlier practice of placing a cross on the east point of the compass, which, considering the European perspective and position, simply represented the direction of the Holy Land. Modern ship compasses stay level despite the rocking of waves, with the use of the Cardan suspension, which appeared in Europe as early as the 9th century. But the Cardon suspension was invented by the Chinese by the 2nd century BC at the latest. This invention, also known as the gimbal, is the basis of the modern gyroscope, making possible the navigation and automatic pilots taken for granted in modern aircraft. In fact, 
The Europeans had always correctly accredited the invention of the compass to the Chinese, but for the wrong reasons. Early Europeans had heard of a famous carriage in China that would always point south, no matter which way it was turned. It sounds like a compass, but the workings of the carriage had nothing to do with magnetism. In the 3rd century AD, this south-pointing carriage, the world's first navigational machine, was invented in China. It had a jade statue of an immortal on the top, which would always point south, no matter which way the carriage turned. Intricate differential gears allowed the cart to turn around the fixed figure of the immortal. The Chinese armies pulled these carriages for navigational purposes, centuries before the invention of the magnetic compass. In the 10th century, the Chinese had invented an odometer, a device for measuring distance travelled. They called it the Li recording drum carriage, with the Li being the Chinese equivalent of a mile. The main wheels turned a set of reduction gears, so that the last axle revolved only once, when the whole engine had travelled one Li. The sequence ended with a catch, which caused a mechanical wooden figure to strike a drum as each wheel passed. An additional set of gears caused another figure to strike every 10 Li. The Chinese also invented novel ways to travel over land. In the 6th century AD, they were attaching sails to wheelbarrows so that the wind took part of the load. This was not the end of their land sailing ambitions. In the year 500 AD, a famous Chinese philosopher constructed a carriage driven by the wind that could carry 30 men and travel hundreds of kilometers every day. These land carriages caused a sensation in Europe during the 16th century, inspiring paintings and poems. The Chinese are not generally thought of as skilled seafarers, probably because of the inferiority of their ships during clashes with the British Navy in the 19th century. But surprisingly, the Chinese led the world in both shipbuilding and sailing techniques for thousands of years. Their vessels, known as junks, were viewed in the West as quaint, but they were, in fact, technologically advanced and perhaps one of the finest sailing vessels ever built. Early Chinese sails had a distinct advantage over European canvas. They were made from bamboo battens, with fabric in between. The bamboo battens also held the sail taut and the sails worked even with holes in it. The sails could be rolled up or down quickly like a Venetian blind. This could easily be done from the deck with less manpower required. Western sailors, on the other hand, had to climb up the rigging, make their way along the yard arms to furl and unfurl sails every time the wind changed. When a storm struck, Chinese sailors didn't have to risk their lives climbing the rigging, as Western sailors did for centuries. The Chinese also invented fore and aft sails, which were aligned along the length of the ship. These sails allowed the Chinese to sail upwind by pivoting from side to side. Until the Europeans conquered this invention in the 1400s, they were unable to sail into a headwind. 
Another Chinese invention adopted by European sailors was the rudder. Chinese ships and riverboats were steered with a single stern-mounted rudder that could be raised or lowered, an advantage in shallow waters of rivers and canals. Until Europeans copied the rudder from the Chinese, Western sailors had to turn their ships with steering oars. Many in the West still think the naval architects who built the Titanic invented watertight compartments called bulkheads for ships, even though they failed spectacularly to keep the liner afloat. But the Chinese constructed their hulls with bulkheads as early as the second century BC. Bamboo inspired the idea because the stalks are made up in sections and chambers. If a ship's hull has only one chamber and is flooded, it will sink. But if the hull has a series of independently sealed chambers and one is flooded, the hull will stay afloat. Marco Polo witnessed ships built with bulkheads in China and described the principle in 1295. But nobody in Europe replicated the concept. Then in the year 1782, the idea was brought to Europe by a British naval architect. With the help of Chinese sailing and shipbuilding technology, Britain built her invincible battle armada and forged her historic empire. During the 10th to the 15th centuries, Chinese warships were by far the most powerful in the world. These warships boasted formidable weapons, including the world's first continuous flamethrower. This horrible weapon has a surprising ancient origin. A similar device was used in the year 675 by the Byzantines. It pumped out bursts of flame, rather like a large syringe. The Chinese invented the first true continuous flamethrower in the 10th century. These flamethrowers use double-acting piston bellows, another Chinese invention, to achieve the continuous stream of flame. This device has two inlet valves. Regardless of whether the plunger was being pushed or pulled, the air could be sucked in on one side and compressed on the other, thus producing a continuous jet of flame. Perhaps the most impressive weapon invented by Chinese navies was the first multi-staged rocket. After launching this rocket, it could apparently fly a meter above the water, as far as a kilometer. When the propulsion rockets burnt out, the gunpowder in the body ignited, launching rocket arrows and destroying the enemy ship. This ancient Chinese rocket, called the Fire Dragon issuing from the water, was an eerie forerunner of the modern Exocet surface skimming naval rocket. China's powerful warships could have easily dominated European navies of the 16th century. So why, during the Opium Wars in the mid-1800s, did the British Navy so easily defeat the Chinese? One reason was the completion of the Grand Canal. This made it easier to transport grain within the country, rather than risk the often dangerous waters around the coast. The demand for ocean-going vessels plummeted and so the great Chinese war fleets were destroyed. The Chinese would rule the seas no more. What's more, the conservative Confucian officials at court gained the upper hand. In their world view, it was improper to go abroad while one's parents were still alive. Barbarian nations were seen as offering little of value to add to the prosperity already present in the Middle Kingdom. 500 years ago, 
when the Europeans were sailing out into the world, the crumbling Great Wall was restored and China began sealing her borders. The wall also reinforced a Chinese mindset against adhering to the lessons of the outside world. But without the importation from China of such things as rudders, a compass and sailing techniques, the British could never have forged her empire. Nor could Columbus have sailed to America. Without the arrival from China of the stirrup, enabling them to stay on horseback, the Knights of Europe would never have created the Age of Chivalry. Without Chinese kites and tops, who knows if the Wright brothers would have made their historic flight? And without ancient Chinese agricultural inventions, the world today would be a very different place. The West, on the foundation of Chinese innovations, raced ahead of the East. Today, very few people in the East or West are aware of the Chinese contribution to the foundation of our modern world.